Thanks so much for coming today and um, you're very welcome and this is a big pleasure for me to share my um, project with you today. So I would like to let you know I am not presenting my PhD research and thesis today so if you were afraid to see a huge methodology you can relax. <laughs> this won't happen today because I would like to share with you my creative approach in working with Ukrainian Canadian music. So I would like to talk to you about performing and the way I work the songs I'm finding in archival collections. So, um, the way that led me to this room um, had a chain of magical circumstances <laughs> uh, which were really beautiful and um, it started somehow in 2012 when I decided to create a um, band, a musical band uh, con which contains of uh, German musicians and invited them to play Ukrainian folklore music. Um, I was excited to share um, the excitement with me, so um, I was really glad to notice that they really liked Ukrainian folklore. And then I started thinking, where can I find all these existing Ukrainian folklore pieces? Um, I started my research and was totally excited about the fact that there is a huge, a huge um, opportunity to find. There's, there are a lot of materials in Canada which were brought, uh, which were brought by Ukrainians coming from Austria-Hungary and bringing folklore music, Ukrainian folklore music here. So, um, then um, let's have a look on early um, collections of Ukrainian Canadian folklore songs in oral tradition, which I started to look at. So, um, the first one was um, a collection is from Yaroslav Lubinitsky. Unfortunately, his recording his recordings uh, were lost. So um, as I learned this, I was so sad so I, that I didn't really want to believe this fact <laughs> and was totally excited um, as I found a small sign of presence of his materials in archives of traditional music in Indiana where I went two weeks ago. So um, in the basement, in Dead Files collection, I found a letter where he wrote, in fact, my collection, my recordings don't exist anymore because I needed space and I erased everything. So, <laughs> I wasn't too excited about this. But uh, this was a movement signed by Rubitsky. Um, however, in the same letter he also wrote, but I have another recordings which are sp stored in Winnipeg. So next week I'm going to Winnipeg and have a big hope to find something. Uh, so far, it, it doesn't seem to exist, in fact, because everyone said that we don't have them. Um, the second collection, um, Tatiana Koshet's collection from 50s. However, this collection doesn't contain sound recordings, so the collection of her songs uh, is on paper. Uh, so here with Robert Klimash, who conducted a huge research and huge field work in the 60s, is the first one to do this, to collect sound recordings of Ukrainian Canadians, uh, to collect sound recordings of Ukrainian folklore songs in Canada, which is totally exciting. As I started working with his songs, um, I um, didn't think it would do that big. Everything started with um, some CD recordings which we have here, which is totally great. Uh, but as far um, as I went further, uh, I noticed that we have actually much more. And there is much more materials in Indiana, the University and um, in uh, Ottawa as well. So let's have a look on Robert Klimash's field collection. 
So it took place in uh, 60s in main Ukrainian settlements in Canada, um, such as Alberta, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. There are about 248 reels with songs, interviews, stories recorded. Uh, mainly, this collection consists from songs. Um, it is partially stored in Alberta, in our collection, in Quebec and Canada, in, in uh, Bloomington and Indiana, in Archive of Regional Music. Um, the biggest part of this collection here was, remains unexplored. Um, in general, there are about 3,000 songs, and um, only about 200 uh, of which were published. But this is great that they were. So, um, I started pulling all materials I could find about uh, those songs and uh, manuscripts of Klimash himself. So, now you can see a picture. This is an uh, index, the most full, in the fullest index which exists uh, at that point as I started to work with. So, it consists of taped, um, taped sheets uh, which list those songs. Um, they were pretty different. Sometimes they were in Ukrainian, then they switched to in, to English language, and um, and the names of the songs were different. So sometimes it was, for example, the first line which was used, like "Oy um, pishlaya na na for example, um, and sometimes um, they are called like a song about a girl, a song about a boy. So it needed to be amount of research, which is actually also exciting. So I uh, started creating um, electronic index and I'm almost done um, with bringing everything together and make it available because I dream to make this wonderful materials one day accessible for further research and other people who, uh, who will look for this. So why did I decide to work with sound recordings and not with um, scores, not with type information, because there are so many reasons for this. I even don't know what to start with because there are so many. Um, one of the main reasons though is uh, that I had experience in my uh, research life where I had some recording and um, first of all I had scores. And uh, then I've seen the scores and lyrics. And then um, later I've seen, um, I've got the recording of the song itself. And I noticed how huge the difference was. So um, it was absolutely not the same, just in terms of musical uh, notation. Another thing is that to write the scores, we usually use the Western music uh, system, which is not absolutely it mm. en enables not completely to write all the features of folklore singing and put it on paper. So there are so many things which are actually impossible to express in 100,000 words. But if you hear the source, you can, you can, you can just hear it and realize. So, for example, such things as features of voice technique. Musical dynamics, phrasing, voice timbre, pronunciation and dialect emotions. For example, I went to uh, Bloomington, Indiana a lot, uh, two weeks ago and I've heard recording um, from Rudnitsky. It was recording from 30s, it was made in Ukraine though. And it was a um, story which one girl was um, telling. It was a story um, and didn't, it didn't have, it didn't contain much description. but. According to the language she used and according to the pronunciation and dialect, it was possible to identify the possible location of this recording and in fact it led me further and enabled me to contact it with further, um, um, completed with further materials and yeah, this is a small example. Um, okay, so now I would like to go to a musical example. So. Robert Klimash did a wonderful job. So he collected beautiful, beautiful songs in oral traditions. The Ukrainian put so much of information in folklore songs. And uh, one more reason why I really do enjoy working with folklore songs is that folklore songs is a wonderful source of information of so many historical evidences and facts 
which are actually only accessible um, sometimes in folklore songs, or they just enable us to uh, experience, um, get in touch with possible experience of our ancestors and people who lived in this time uh, frame. For example, immigration songs of Ukrainians, they have so much information about names of ferries they use, names of guys they pay five bucks for, for transportation and so on, the routes they use. And this is just put in the song and um, this is somehow beautiful and magnificent. So I would like to present you one recording um, which was published. So this is uh, actually a Christmas song. Uh, it was sung by Mr. Kirill Kotick in Manitoba in summer 66. I would like to play, I'm sorry, this is not the part I want to play, but this one. I'm sorry, this is not this one. But this one. They are so beautiful, they are so, they are so real. <laughs> so maybe you've noticed that uh, the tempo of the song, um, if you would want to put it in a band arrangement and create a song which you would like to bring on stage in the context of performance with normal, in a normal band setting. So you would need to do something with tempo because you might have noticed that um, He's singing by himself, so he doesn't have any accompaniment. So he's naturally getting a little bit um, uh, quicker in tempo, and then and then it goes slower, and so on, right? So, for example, now you have you see a screenshot. I wonder maybe we can get the lights a little yeah. bit, but not too much. Oh, not so much. Yeah. So, for example, you can see this is a screenshot in uh, program Logic software, which is usually used to work in, uh, in such situations. So, um, this blue line is uh, melody line, is the song line of Mr. Krilo Kotick. Um, so, what I did in this case, I just uh, cut it and uh, pushed the parts a little bit apart and created it was a kind of a demo for my band. I wrote an arrangement and created it. Um, to in order to let my band know what, what which musical arrangement do I have in my head to suggest. So you need to cut it and to push a little bit, um, and then sometimes you need to work in separate pieces and change the tempo of each one of them because even though they are separated, sometimes they are still one piece is too too quick and another one is too slow. So this is a kind of a technical up, uh, work, but this is um, also interesting actually. Yeah, another thing is that um, those recordings, they were recorded on reel to reels and then they were transferred to our, this particular recording, it was transferred to a vinyl record and then I digitized it from vinyl record to a digital form and we can clearly hear this which you actually would like to filter out possibly, yeah, if you would like to put it in a concept of context of performance. So, yeah, then you can filter some noises, doing this manually, find the peaks and filter them out and do as much as possible because it will possibly never get too perfect, what is perfect, <laughs> uh, because if you're filtering too much then you get in then you touch in some frequencies of the voice itself and um, what we don't know or don't want. Okay, so um, then I decided to create um, 
before bringing this on stage, I would think you maybe to take a part of a folklore costume, which would mean something special to me and have a connect connection to this. So I found an archival picture of um, a wedding piece, which was made in Austria-Hungary, where Ukrainians also came for, who mainly uh, recorded those songs. <laughs> And um, so I didn't like it. I, I did really like it because it was so special and not the typical Ukrainian wet I knew. Um, yeah, so far I know it was a part of wedding costume. And um, I was so lucky to find someone who was able to recreate it almost completely. Um, yeah, so as close as possible to the original. And it took over months of work because it was absolutely manually done each tiny flower. Yeah, and then we got transported to Germany. This is a huge box. <laughs> yeah, but this worked. Okay, now um, I would like to show you uh, an example of this song. What exactly did it... What was the product at the end? So this summer in June we had a presentation in Wiesbaden in Germany. It's a city not far from Frankfurt of uh, this Ukrainian-Canadian program. And we decided to include, uh, or yeah, this original recording to the band context and uh, right arrangement. So the specific of this is also that those songs they don't contain contain special musical harmony. Like they don't have many, they don't have chords. This is just a melody. So you're pretty flexible in uh, finding possible arrangement or chords you can put to it. So um, so this is my suggestion, and um, yeah, I would like to show it to you.
Thank you so much. Um, I really enjoyed this project because um, our the people who come to our concert, they are not only Ukrainians, there are so many Germans and people from Austria and Poland and Ukraine and Russia and so many other countries. And this is um, this is a really way for me to um, bring those songs on stage again and um, to talk about um, to talk about the things and information um, folklore songs contain. Not only Ukrainian songs, there are so many also other songs and this is just so important that nowadays when people, especially when people talk about um, the importance of democracy and when people are so afraid about immigrants somehow all over the world and people still talk about human rights and so on. This is somehow, um, I uh, think this is important to talk about uh, example of Ukrainians in Canada and uh, bring the songs on stage again and um, during the concert I'm talking about the context of this on, and immigration and um, yeah I like the thing the fact that people actually enjoying this and maybe they are um, not even maybe but I know really that people um, after our concert say sometimes come to me and say this is so interesting I didn't even think that maybe our local library also has folklore recordings of this and that and uh, they sometimes go and ask and start um, uh, their own research and uh, this is actually interesting and um, yeah, beautiful. So, um, I would like to... Um, there are more songs uh, we bring on stage in this context. Um, so, um, in terms of Klimash collection, so um, there are different groups of songs he defines uh, by himself, like songs of immigration, hardship, disillusionment, praise, <coughs> macronic songs, ritual, folk songs. And um, so far I'm working with them. This is so, so interesting because sometimes um, when I hear a new song, for example, in Wilmington, I uh, had a great opportunity to hear two sources I didn't hear before and they had they have a lot of unidentified songs and um, I identified all the songs and the materials which they gave me access to for these two days uh, during my stay there and it was so interesting because they were unidentified and uh, one of the examples uh, which impressed me so much it was one song um, which one woman sang it was about her husband who left her and went back to Ukraine. So she stayed in Canada and from the moment when her husband went back and left her, she ch her children stopped uh, contacting her and she's singing, she's so sad. And then she started crying and she still she sang this song and the melody was not too prominent so it was a pretty simple melody and <coughs> it felt like it didn't have the primary importance for her. The, the dominance of the melody was not that huge, but her expression. The interesting moment also that this song also didn't uh, contain any rhyme. It was much more lamentary, like uh, laments people usually sang in uh, uh, rituals like uh, funerals. And impress it. This impressed me so much actually because. Um, this enabled me to think about why do people actually sing? She could also say, I would like to tell you a story. This is probably, if I speculate, maybe it is her autobiographical story which tells um, about her, her life, what it happened. Because she, it really felt like this, it really sounded like this as well. So, um, but she still sings, she doesn't tell. Uh, and said, you know, my husband went away and I left alone. She's singing about this. And this context also, or this supports also this tradition which Ukrainians had more and sometimes it still exists, but not that prominent that it was before that people came together and start singing like sentiment circle like we know <laughs> and start singing all possible songs on actually we would sing about what had happened today and I would sing I I went to harp and bought a coffee I I yeah. and such things yeah 
<laughs> somehow, it is somehow a way of sharing experiences, and the song is still a source, and this is still a moving element, and somehow it is still necessary. So, um, this is what a really beautiful idea um, and feeling I, I had. Yeah. Yes, you excited scholar in Wilmington <laughs> who had a uh, good opportunity to get in touch with materials. So, um, yeah, so the um, people who primarily uh, were informants for Kimash's collection were people who um, went to Canada in the first immigration wave, which was before the Soviet uh, Union. Uh, time, which also, um, which also makes possible to uh, contact the songs which doesn't exist in Ukraine as well, because they didn't get in touch with Soviet context, and um, for sure, Ukrainian folklore in Canada and Ukraine developed differently, also because of this. So yes, um, yeah. If you would like to hear more of this music, you can access it everywhere. You can go to the home page and all other things you see here, uh, you, you're so welcome to write me an email um, if you're too shy to talk to me in person. <laughs> 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 yeah. However, I'm uh, very lucky it's about the <laughs> possibility to uh, talk to um, field worker Bogdan Klimash himself next day. So, um, I will be taking an interview and asking him questions. So, if you have ideas, those questions you would like me to ask him you're so welcome to let me know now or writing an email or SMS or something else yes I think yeah this is so far that's it thank you so much